say it's nice to have the opportunity to talk about what is perhaps more in the craft, more in the art area than pure science or engineering. So thank you for that opportunity. So this is a story about um, a tool that we, we built at, at the University of Kent for, for doing some capturing um, and about a concept that, of clone detection, what a clone is, and, and how those things turn out in practice. So I'm going to show you some code. I've not seen much code on slides today. You will see some code. Um, you'll be able to... Um, you'll, see some code. You'll, you'll hear some, some feedback about how using this tool to implement this concept work out in practice. So the tool is a tool called Wrangler, a, a refactoring tool. Um, you can guess it's a refactoring tool because Wrangler is almost an anagram of Erlang. <laughs> but nobody understood, so I, if you have to explain the joke, so that you feel it's less of a, less of a joke. The concept is, is what, what a code clone is, um, and the practice was to do some case studies with Ericsson, uh, the telecoms firm, who were a user of, quite a large user of, of LA. And I'd like to thank the European Commission for sponsoring this research. Um, some of us in, in the UK would like to continue thanking the European Union. <laughs> <laughs> the Patriots have denied that joy to us. Anyway. So, um, what I'll try to get out of this, or, or get across, is some insights that come from that, that story. So, one of the insights is about how to design tools, um, how to design refactoring tools. We've got a, very, a lot of very useful Detailed information about that, but also some general lessons. Um, so issues about what a code clone, being a code clone, might mean, um, and and finally the practice of once we've established what we think a code clone is, something about the practice of, of clone detection and elimination. Okay, so that's the idea. That's what I want to talk about. Just a few a few minutes on. What I'm going to, what, what I'm going to be the subject of this. Um, <clears throat> it's based on Erlang, um, and the, as I say, it's based on a tool for Erlang. But I would contend that the lessons that come out of this are not Erlang specific. You may want to argue with that, but um, <coughs> my, my hypothesis is that the insights are not simply about Erlang. So Erlang is a functional language. Um, it's functional basis. It does have some side effects, and for example, concurrency is implemented as functions with side effects. Um, it's got a language for fault tolerance, um, it's got a library for fault tolerance, it's got some dynamic aspects. So it's, it, it really it shows the fact it's a relatively small language, and it was designed to do specific things, and so it's a bit of a hybrid. It, it's got a number of aspects, all of which were included for a particular purpose. Um, it's relatively easy going, it doesn't, doesn't enforce types at compile time. It's got a reasonable system of uh, ecosystem of tools, um, it's open source, it's what powers WhatsApp, um, various SMEs, and it's Ericsson have been the people who have kept it going over the years, so now it's got a very large open source community as well. So it's a typical typical language, it's not very big. Um, it's got things in common with some functional languages. It also is reminiscent of C in some ways because of its size and its relatively freewheeling approach. But I think it's representative enough for us to draw conclusions. <coughs> I'm not sure I need to explain what refactoring is, but let me, let me do that. It's about changing the design or the structure of a program without changing its behavior. Um, so, some code. Typical refactoring that we've implemented in our line is generalization. We've got a function here, which adds one. We think, why does it just add one? Let's make that a parameter. So we generalize it. And now we've got a function which will add a number. But of course, we've got a function called add one. It will add any number. So the next thing we have to do is rename it to add an integer. So often when you do one refactoring, you have to do other refactorings as well. Um, so that's the sort of thing that we implement. You select the one and choose to do a generalization, and we will do that. We will 
as you can see, we will change um, calls to the function. We put in the original parameter there as the, as the actual parameter. Now we generalize, for example. So refactorings can be diffuse. They can come in your whole code, whole code base. So you need a tool. Um, and there are other things come along. We choose to generalize over an expression which has A, a free variable, and B, a side effect. We need to wrap that up inside a closure. So we have to do some information about, we have to do some analysis about um, potential side effects of the program. So I think this is there just to underline the fact that a refactoring tool isn't just an editor on steroids. It's got, it's got a whole lot of other facilities. It's effectively the front end of a compiler. And using all the analyses that the front end of a compiler will provide you with to support those things. So we built the tool, around it, it does various structural process, macro refactorings, integrated with Emacs and Eclipse and so on and so forth. I suppose what we discovered in doing this, um, but this is well known, um, was that, that refactorings aren't just about transformations. The crucial thing about, it's relatively easy to do transformations often, the harder thing is to make sure you, you have the right conditions to make sure your transformation preserves meaning. We've got a whole project looking at that at the moment um, in the context of a different program language. What we chose to do, and I think this underlies our approach, um, is that we implement simple things. We implement things like generalization, renaming, moving things between modules, changing the scope of the definition and so on. We don't try and do complicated things. But what we try and do is help you do the complicated things yourselves. I think the analogy here is between RISC and CISC. If you remember that debate in the 1980s about instruction sets. Instruction set, well, I suppose we're back there again somewhat with, with um, x86. Instruction sets were becoming more and more archaic. You put in an instruction to do this particular thing, that's fine, but your compiler never hits it. What you want to do is have a small set of instructions which are implemented well. Same with refactoring. Um, right, let me move on, I'll come back to those other, those other points. Let's talk about clone detection. Do you think a code is considered harmful? We can argue whether it is or not, but it can be considered harmful. <coughs> but we need to decide what we mean by duplicate code. And this is where the, the discussion about what a clone starts. We could, we could ask the question, what is identical code? A language is expression oriented, um, so we're looking at expressions. We could say that these things are identical. We've got something like a variable and a number. Um, we want to, we might, we, uh, we might not care about the names of variables, but we probably want to represent them to reflect binding instruction. Actually, we decided we would do something else. We, we wanted to reflect similarity. And so what we chose to do was say that two pieces of code were similar if we had a common generalization. So we're doing anti-unification here. So we look at two expressions and we say they're similar. If you can, what you're doing here is effectively for taking a function body, which is a common abstraction of the two instances. So the anti-unification gives us that most specific common generalization. So what we want to do is look for sequent expressions or sequences of expressions that can be anti-unified. The way we do this is in two phases. We look for potential candidate clones by an efficient string matching model. Um, and then we check whether they are using an, an analysis over the AST. So we get potential false positives, which we eliminate by an AST analysis. Are these things, here's a clone candidate. They look, those things look similar in shape. We can cut this up in two ways. We can find a real clone in here in two different ways. If we just look at the first three expressions of those, all four are a clone. We have three x3 assignments, and we, after the end of that, we need the three results. So we take those three assignments and we bundle up the results so that they can be used in the context. I just wanted to underline the point here that we can, we're not just looking at expressions, but we're looking at sequence of expressions, and those expressions can be bindings like this. They're like single assignments, so they're bindings rather than assignments. Um, or we can 
can say we've got two, two clones which are actually identical. The pink ones here are, we have three assignments, they return in order, first, second, third. The uh, bluey ones have the three assignments, they're returned in, in a list in the, in the reverse order. So there we identify um, clones that are themselves bigger, but we have fewer instances. Um, but we do an analysis which reports all this information back to, um, to the user. But we have to do it with some thresholds. We have to decide, is it big enough? Is it important enough? Is enough generalization going on? Is too much generalization going on? We have to decide some thresholds on various parameters. We might say we only want things that are five expressions or more, you know, a reasonable piece of, of, of code. We might decide we want, we want, if we're looking at single expressions, they have to contain a reasonable number of tokens. Because of course you can generalize any two expressions to a single variable. Um, so we might, the number of variables introduced will reflect the number of places that the clones are different, where we've done a real abstraction from the, um, from the code we're looking at. And we might be interested in similarity, where we measure the size of the unification over the size of the original. If you've got two expressions, you can unify them to a variable. So we need to have a threshold on not on the, the unification being reasonably large compared to the original. So we can choose a collection of these, we've got all these, we've got these thresholds. We then need to think of values for them. And our defaults in the, in the um, system that you get, we say, well, we want at least five expressions, we want 20 tokens. We want to introduce, we want no more than four places where we have to introduce a new variable, where there are substantial differences between the clones. And we want the rim at the abstraction to be 80% of the size of the original. Now, those are purely arbitrary. Um, and the lesson. First lesson I wanted to, to, to get across is you know, we could change, we could choose which of these are significant. We did not, we didn't used to look at number of tokens, but that becomes important if you drop the number of, of expressions to one. <coughs> we didn't used to look at the number of variables introduced, but you will, um, you can finish up making any two pieces of code similar if you introduce a variable for every possible subpart of it. So you need to, um, and a point I'll come up with later, each time you introduce a variable representing a point of difference, you're going to have to give that variable a name. You're going to have to think about what that difference means. And similarities. So we've got to choose those. Let's choose them all, but we have to choose. So things that are lessons, things that are, are questions that, that um, come up from this, observations that come up, I, I, I put a pink header behind. We've got to choose thresholds, we've got to choose threshold values. <coughs> um, so what we'll do for the rest of the talk is I'll, I'll use those defaults, but in doing the exploration, we'll probably change those. We'll probably find some instances of code where we want to change those values up or down or suppress something, because our, our search is leading us somewhere that we um, looking at the code as indicated, and which didn't come immediately out of the an automated analysis based on those data. So, um, another thing to say, we support two modes. Just tell me all the clones. This is how you start. Just tell me all the clones. You find later on you actually want to pursue things down a bit of a rabbit hole, you start looking for clones of a particular expression sequences of expressions. Okay, so that's where we're at. Our case study was, uh, it's medium size, it's about 2,000, what, 2,600 lines of code, some test code for, um, you know, you know, code for uh, the session initi initiation protocol, some code that had gone through a number of hands, particularly in Ericsson, um, it's a part of the SIP stack, which is a, a stack for doing internet telephony. Not terribly relevant, but it's, it's production code. Um, there was a test code in there. 
Test code was interesting because lots of people touch it. Um, one thing we observed was there's a lot of copy, paste, and modify in there. Um, because nobody really cares about writing tests, they just slap something down. Um, but you've got, it's like it was a good representative of a long standing project because things were changing, the change, a number of authors were there, we could see that the changes have been there. Now, you could, if all you were interested in was reducing the lines of code, you could, I mean, I spent, I think, an hour, I got the code down from 2,600 lines down to 2,000 lines. I could, I could carry on doing that. Just by aggressively removing all the clones I found. That was of no value at all. I had clones called clone number one, which had introduced new variables, new variable one, new variable two, new variable three. I simply chosen the clone at the top of my report list, didn't necessarily mean anything. So it's clear you need to involve experts. <coughs> here's a typical, here's part of the report, or the structure of the report at the time. You get told, here's the clone. Um, these are the places where it is. This is the, the start of the clone the code. So this is, in two instances, massive. How long is it? It's nearly 100 lines long. Um, and you can see, look at that, one of the new variables, one of the places of differences, is actually inside a comment. Ha! Huh. So they've copied it. Um, so it's a, it's a fascinating way of just exploring code. It's a way of understanding code. But clearly, if you're in that situation or you're in another situation, um, the result you will get from your report is, here's the, the thing that instantiates the flow, it's called new file, and it's got these new variables. Somebody has to name those. Somebody who understands the application enough has to give those names. So that's a lesson. There's a report, that's a report on a previous slide. This was something flown 15 times, and it had this. In fact, that was actually repeated. You can see there are no variables introduced there, so it's actually code that was repeated 15 times. Um, okay. So, in those reports, you see something, um, you see the extremes, you see the, um, you see the example here, which is a huge, great clone of one thing repeated almost verbatim, twice, and here you see things which are um, repeated lots of times. Which do you go for? You know, you're, 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 the straw man here, the straw person, is the automatic press the button eliminate my clones. Right. <coughs> do you go for the big clone or do you go for the clone that appears lots of times? We did come to a conclusion here. It's best to work bottom up. Try and identify things which are short and can be named. And then they will contribute, of course, to, to um, the body of your larger clone anyway. Try and identify. So bottom up seem to work better than top down. So that's the first pragmatic lesson we came up with. <coughs> the general pattern we have is spot the clone, introduce the generalization, eliminate the instances. So we've done that. We decided to work bottom up, bottom up rather than top down. What's the problem? Well, here's a potential problem. Here's a nice 23 line clone. We found that. So this is where we start showing some code. It, but in a sense, you could just pattern that. You've just got code here. It's, it's code. Um, we've got 23 lines here. But what we saw in looking at this, um, because this was bigger, we hadn't triggered on a, um, on a shorter clone, on a shorter piece of code. But in fact, looking at that, the engineer said, well, let's work with that first. Um, so then we, that was where we used our search mode. We said, well, we want to find all the clones of this. So we used it in that directed way. So we may choose a subclone. We may not choose the clone that was identified. We may choose a subclone. Um, so we've done that, and that's what we, we produced. Um, and this works reasonably well. And what we've done here is we were lucky. We were able to fill in some names that look quite like the names that you see in the Um, one other lesson, um, there's always a temptation to make your clone a bit more general. Um, we have 
have to, and all the details of this are in the paper. Um, it was possible. There were some variants of the thing we'd identified. It just checked in a different table. It checked in SVG filter table in, rather than SMM filter. Should we make that another parameter? <coughs> we decided not to. We thought, let's name the simpler thing and let's see where we go from there. Because if you add more parameters, you've got to name the parameters, you've got to name the operation itself. Um, so we wanted to avoid overgeneralization. Um, but we got, on the other hand, if you do that in too fine-grained a way, we got what's called premature generalization. And so we were generalizing things too early. We were generalizing over a small part of code, which when we discovered later on, could be built, turned into a bigger clone. Our reports weren't perhaps guiding us in that direction. So we needed to inline what we've done already <coughs> in order to find our, um, the optimal clone to identify and put into our, our code. So it's just because you can imagine, otherwise you could finish up with a whole layer of general you know, function A calls function B calls function C calls function D, whereas in fact you just want function A to be a block of code which does something. Um, so, tricky to decide. One particular thing we saw, um, I don't think, the phrase widows and orphans is the one from, from text processing, where you maybe get a line that, that one last line of a paragraph goes on to the next page. What I was thinking of here was this situation. We found this identified as a clone. There's an assignment at the beginning, and then we, there's a comment that says add rule sets to filter. That sounds like it does something useful. And then remove rule sets. This was what was identified, including the last expression which was generalized. Now that's a bit suspicious. Having an expression being generalized means there's something completely different. So we chose not to identify this as the clone, but to throw away the first line and the last line. That gives us a slightly different parameterization. You can see that we get the rule sets there. It gives us a smaller return set, as we return all the things that we need later on in the code in a tuple. We only return the rule sets that have been created. We don't return this filter but instead, we pass it in as an argument right at the beginning. We, we define it further on, and then we return it. And because, of course, if we're passing it in, it's still usable in the context in which this is called. So we have a, um, we cut down on the number of parameters. Well, we've got the same number of parameters, change the number of, uh, change the parameters, sorry. We cut down on the size of the rules. Because the thing, Conceptually, so morally, people might say, this is the clone. These two lines have just got accidentally called before and after that true clone was, um, was used in the instances where we identified them. So, again, it's hard to, we're just getting this report from our, our system. It's hard for us to tell that these are. But we can see that maybe you could do a slicing analysis. There is there is option there for doing that. Um, you might see you were, you were using more pure value there. But certainly that's making things a lot more sophisticated. Um, so another insight. Um, this sort of refactoring um, was led us to understand the code better. Um, and that you can see in manifest in two ways. We did, um, there are situations where you would have one clone identified and another one following it. But the thing in between was slightly different. If you see that situation, you can manually refactor the line or two of code in between and put, make the two clone, unify those two clones. <coughs> so we saw that happen. So we were able, through getting that information, to improve the code. But that was a that was very much our goal. We also identified some bugs. So there's a place where um, we saw some code code had been cloned. In one instance, the parameter was something ending with recovery. In the second instance, it was something ending 
rovery. So obviously somebody on copy and pasting that had managed to miss, had managed to, to delete the characters E and C. Um, and so that should have, those should have been identical. So we discovered a bug that had been introduced by copy and paste. So that's a useful lesson. Um, okay. We did various things in the refactoring tool, um, some detailed stuff, which I don't want to go into. A couple of things we did that were more um, large scale, we, did, we introduced an incremental clone detection process so that you could incorporate that in your nightly build so you could see if any clones had been introduced in that day's programming. Um, and that was a, one of the, the partners on the protest project used that in production. And the other thing we did was we, we, um, we introduced a domain-specific language for scripting refactoring. And one of the core examples we had was a, um, a refactor, it was a script for um, performing clone elimination. So what you have to do when you eliminate a clone, once you've got the new function, you have to rename the function. You have to rename the variables, there aren't any there, but um, in general there are some variables. And then what you have to do is you have to replace all the instances by a call to that function. Um, now there's a question in refactorings. If you're building a complex refactoring, what is its transactionality? Do I require all these things to succeed for the refactoring to succeed? The answer is it depends. In this case, we do want the rename to succeed. We do want renaming the variables to succeed, but it doesn't matter if a particular instance doesn't get replaced. Again, it doesn't matter. It may not be because of name flash or whatever, it may not work. But the whole thing can succeed if that succeeds and that succeeds, but we don't care about that. So a key thing we had in our DSL was transactionality. So it wasn't simply an API, we wanted to control the transactionality of complex things in terms of their control. So the lesson is, you can't eliminate the human from this process. We need tooling to make the whole process of clone detection practical, but there has to be a human in the loop, irrespective, I, I would assert, of language, tool, and application. Um, the right notion of clone for a particular project is coming from a complex space of parameters and thresholds. That just seems to be a fact. Um, and, Refactoring in practice relies on a set of complex choices and trade-offs, which just can't be automated. So I think, well, it's a challenge. The AI that will do all this for me, I think is quite a long way off. So I'd leave you with that thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you show the slide again where you have the list of uh, thresholds you have to choose? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, and I, I'm wondering whether whether impact might be an interesting threshold because if you, if you have five lines that's repeated 10,000 times or seven lines that's repeated only once. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, what we do, sorry, well, one thing I should have explained is we present these reports in two orders. We give you the order of clones in the size of the body of the, the clone. We also give you the number of times it occurs, so you can search them in those two orders. I guess you could produce a, comp a, a combined metric that somebody might be and multiply the two together. Yeah, that would be, we decided to do the two separately, but you could think of doing it. But you know, how do you do, what, what choice do you make? It's all, but I think, I hope this, I hope I, I, I justified wanting to do it in the conference, which is talking about art and art. Okay, thanks again. Thanks.